Well, hey, hey, what's up, everybody? Good to see you guys this morning. Hello, everybody in the lobby, online, on the patio. So glad that you are here today. Um, I just need to clarify one thing before we get started. Mike is a liar, and um, I definitely got a better grade than him in Acts class, just for the record. I mean, come on. <laughs> you guys know, all right? Um, no, I'm so glad that you're here today as we continue in this series, wrap up this series that we have been doing called Someone Like You. We've been taking the the uh, show The Chosen and kind of looking through the different disciples of Jesus and their stories as they chose to follow him and what that looks like. It's been such a cool series uh, to experience together, to learn more about Jesus together and who he is and what he calls us to, and to be reminded that there's really no perfect people allowed. Like since he started call, calling followers, they were imperfect, broken, messy, doubting people that he invited into his story. That's been the story of all time. That's why we say around here that in church, there are no perfect people allowed. If you're perfect, you got to go. Because for us, this is a reminder every single week for us to, rem to remember that those are the kind of people that Jesus called into his story. These people who were a little bit lost until they were found by him. It's so frustrating being lost, isn't it? I am notoriously lost. I get lost all the time. Many of you have heard some of my stories of getting lost. Uh, for example, anybody travel over the holidays? Any travelers just get back? No, everybody stayed pretty local. It's because we live in Ventura, in, in Oxnard, in California, and it's beautiful here. People should come to us, okay, for Thanksgiving. It's cold everywhere else. Anyways, um, so sometimes when I travel, I get lost. There, uh, one time I was traveling, uh, and I had driven for three hours uh, before I realized I was going in the wrong direction ended up in the wrong state, okay? Huh. That's actually happened to me twice, uh, to be honest with you. Um, I use my watch to find my phone, to find my keys pretty much every single morning. Uh, the other day, I was uh, visiting a friend, and she let me borrow her car, and then I went and I parked in a parking garage, and then I went inside, I spent the day in the building, and I came back out, and I realized the only thing I could remember about her car was that it was white, and it was an SUV, and my phone was dead, and I couldn't call her and ask. I spent an hour walking around that parking garage like the saddest human you've ever seen, clicking at every white car I could find to see if the, you know, the lights would blink. Uh, I mean, I was long enough to like sit down and have a snack. Like That's how long it took me to find the car. It's a true story. Anybody else have conversations with Siri in the car? You know, And she's like, turn left, and you're like, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I know that I get lost all the time, but when she says stuff, I'm like, I don't know if you really know the best route. And so I feel like if she could talk back to me, most of her uh, conversations would be like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like, are you kidding me? Please just do what I'm asking you to do, okay? I'm grateful for a husband who is not notoriously lost. He always knows where we are going, what we are doing. Whenever we do anything together, it's just like a load off my mind because he can just find where we are. There have been times I thought, if you left right now, I literally, I literally have no idea where we are. <laughs> like, I, what a luxury, right? To be able to follow somebody that knows where they are going, and I'm so grateful uh, for his superpowers of direction that I do not have because it's frustrating being lost. So if you're walking in today and you feel a little lost, you're not alone. If you feel like you're struggling a little bit to find your way, to figure out your plan, to figure out who you are, you're in good company. If you're not quite sure where you're going in your life or how to get there, I know it can be frustrating to feel lost, but I know somebody. I know somebody who is the way. And his name is Jesus, and he has a pathway for you, and he's inviting someone like you and someone like me to follow him. And I know this because of the story that we're going to be looking at today. We've looked at several of the disciples. Today, we're going to get to a story of a guy named Matthew. And so if you have your Bibles, you can follow along on your Bibles. You can follow along on the screen. Uh, you can follow along in the app. But we're going to start in Matthew 9.9. And, it, and it's the story of when Matthew decided to follow Jesus. It goes like this. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting in a tax collector's booth. Now, I'm going to stop right here for a second. You probably maybe have heard us talk about tax collectors before, but it's a very essential part of Matthew's story because it's kind of crazy that he got called to follow Jesus because he was a misfit, an outcast, like a total reject among the people, um, among the Jewish people of his time. 
Uh, He lived in a Roman occupied territory with other Jews, but his job as a tax collector was to go to these Jews and collect taxes. Um, His fellow countrymen collect taxes for the occupying country. And the Romans didn't really care if they overtaxed, they just wanted their tax so the tax collectors could collect whatever they wanted. So they often robbed their friends, their neighbors, their family members, and they took more than they um, actually needed and that were actually owed, and they pocketed the money and kept the money for themselves. So they were basically just like the worst. Uh, Most references in the Gospels even say like tax collectors and sinners because I think that sinners are like, don't put me in that group, okay? Like I'm a tax tax collector, you know? Uh, Tax collectors were educated. They could read and write. And what I think is interesting about Matthew's story in particular is that he was from the same region as the disciples. One of the biggest taxes of that time was tax on export import from sea and land. So one of the biggest people that you would be taxing as a tax collector were fishermen, and most of the disciples were fishermen. So it's a good chance that Matthew was even their personal tax collector, like the ones that he went to and robbed. But here he was, and Jesus has an interaction with him. He says two little words to him in Matthew 9. He just says, follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. Some quick observations about this moment that I think are pretty cool. See, Matthew wasn't an idiot. He knew how religious people felt about him. He was not expected or expecting to be invited in. And Jesus says these two little words to Matthew, follow me. He could have said a lot of other words to him, I think. He could have said, you're a traitor. You're a disappointment. You're not good enough. You know better. You should have done better, but he doesn't. He says, follow me. I bet Matthew was surprised by that. If Jesus said a couple of words to you, what do you think they would be? Do you think you would be surprised by what he asked you? Follow me. Whatever happened in this moment changed Matthew's life forever. It's likely that Matthew was probably wealthy, like he had uh, a lot of esteem within the community among the Romans. He had a lot of privilege, a lot of power. And in this moment, he meets Jesus with these two words. He drops everything, gives up everything in that moment to follow him. He didn't even know who Jesus was or what he was capable of or what he was actually going to do here. And he risked everything to follow I think sometimes we think that following Jesus is uh, kind of like a weak thing to do. It's like admitting that, you know, you need a savior and you need help and, and you need someone to lead your life. And it seems like a weak thing to do, but it is such a courageous thing to do. He knew he didn't fit in with the other people following Jesus, but he followed anyway. And you know who else knew he didn't fit in with the people following Jesus? The people following Jesus. Matthew was the disciples, you know, not those people. Like, you know, those people, we sort of all have those people in our lives. My those people might be different than your those people. But in our minds, we have those people who are sort of like, not, not like those people. Like, those people aren't really invited in. But Matthew, he was one of those people for the disciples. I mean, how crazy it is that people who have been invited in would try to keep other people out. It's like such a crazy thing that happened so long ago that we never do anymore, right? But even though Matthew was one of those people for the other disciples, Jesus doesn't care. He doesn't care what his other disciples think about him or how uncomfortable it makes them. He just says, follow me. And I love the way uh, that this is portrayed in The Chosen. So take a look at it. I think I've gone something like this. You see the Parthian foot races last night? Darius ran like a gazelle. Jews don't go to foot races. Your old friend Simon himself used to run the wagering tables. We're not friends. Next. Okay, fine. So you did not go to the races. You stay home? I went to see my mother. Ugh, that would put me out, too. She asked when you're going to give her grandchildren? She didn't ask. I thought your parents don't speak to you. I had questions I couldn't ask anyone else. A mother of a son with talent like yours should be proud. 
She's ashamed that I could use the talent that God gave me against God. Next. You're good at something. You found a way to make a living doing it. It's that simple. Must be nice to live in a world so simply ordered. We live in the same world, Matthew. Next. Besides, what else are you going to do with a mind like yours? Matthew. Matthew, son of Alpheus. Yes. Follow me. Me? <laughs> yes, you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh. What are you doing? You want me to join you? Keep moving, street preacher. Do you have any idea what this guy has done? Do you even know him? Yes. Listen, I said to... What are you doing? Where do you think you're going? Guys, let me go. Have you lost your mind? You have money. Quintus protects you. No Jew lives as good as you. You're going to throw it all away. Yes. I don't get it. You didn't get it when I chose you either. But this is different. I'm not a tax collector. Get used to different. I'm glad we passed by your booth today, Matthew. Yes. Shall we? We have a celebration to prepare for. You will regret this, Matthew. What's the tablet for? I grabbed it without thinking. You can put it back. No, no, keep it. You may yet find use for it. Where are we going? A dinner party. I'm not welcome at dinner parties. Well, that's not going to be a problem tonight. You're the host. But, yeah, <laughs> so cool. It's so cool to just get a picture of what that could be like, what that would have looked like for those guys. I love Peter's like, what the heck is going on? And Jesus doesn't care. He's like, I'm inviting him to follow. And one of the, my favorite moments is that when Jesus looked over and says, get used to different. Because I can't imagine better advice for you if you're going to follow Jesus is to get used to different. Because it has been different since the very beginning, since he came. I mean, the second that he showed up, everybody was waiting for the Messiah. They thought he was going to come, and they thought that he was going to conquer Rome, and that he was going to lead this revolution here on earth for a short period of time. But that is not what God was doing at all. He had us in mind in an auditorium 2,000 years later, people who had devoted their lives to follow Jesus and to learn the way. And that is different, but get used to different. They thought that he would show up as a big king, but he showed up as a baby in a manger with a couple of teenage parents as they try to figure out and navigate what it was like to raise the Son of God. Get used to different. Jesus came not as a king on a throne. He came to serve, not to be served, to die so that we could live. It's like get used to different if you are going to follow Jesus. It was so different. He was so different. And we just see how different he was when we look at this party that uh, Matthew throws at his house. It's true that Matthew did throw a party the second that Jesus invited him in. That's what he did. And he invited everybody because that's uh, how, when you know that it is amazing that you have been invited into something. When you know how crazy it is that you have been loved irregardless of what you have done. Then what you do is you throw a party and you invite your friends and you introduce them to Jesus. So guess what happens again? People who don't even want in with Jesus because of who he lets in, they get mad at the people who are in. 
Isn't it crazy that people who have been invited in would try and keep other people out? Check out what happens during this party. In Matthew 9, 10, it says, while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with his disciples. That's the only people that Matthew knew. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? People who would never eat with tax collectors and sinners are mad that someone else is eating with them. And on hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners. Well, that's different. And if you're wondering who's invited to follow Jesus, first of all, he invites someone like you. We see this from Matthew's story. You don't have to pretend to be something you're not. You don't have to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You don't have to get it together. He takes you as you are. It's actually those of us who know and admit that we're sick, admit that we have need, admit that we need a savior. That is actually who's invited in. It's the Pharisees and the religious people that say, change and you can join us. But Jesus says, join us and you will change. You get to follow first. If you're misfit, disliked, unlikely, different, you are invited in. Being imperfect doesn't disqualify you. It is actually a prerequisite. It is actually part of it. And actually, what's interesting to me, when you look at all the disciples, you can see that you don't even have to believe before you start to follow. None of them did. None of them knew who Jesus was. He was constantly talking to them about their disbelief, and they would say, help me with my unbelief. You don't even have to believe he is who he says he is yet. You can just come and you can find out and you can follow. You are invited in. And it might look different than you thought. It's people who are nothing like Jesus liked Jesus. And he liked them. And that includes someone like you and someone like me. And it also includes someone nothing like you. Yes. Even those people, whoever those people were, when I said those people earlier in your head, when you're like, well, not those people. Yes, those people, the ones we have disqualified, the ones we can't stand, the ones who have it all wrong. Who are those people for you and for me? The people who have been invited in should be the quickest to invite other people in. Jesus actually said that you would know his disciples by their love. And sometimes I look around at us and I wonder if people feel that way. Are you sure? How well do we love the ones who have different opinions than us, different politics, different lifestyles, different skin color, different backgrounds, different religions, all the different from you and me and where we are most comfortable? Guess what? They are invited to follow too. Get used to different or you're going to hate heaven. He invites even all of those the sick, the sinners, the different, in, and he invites them just like he invites you and me. And he invites us to follow him. And with Jesus, that means he invites us into the different, into a different way of life, different priorities, different way of living, different friendships, different relationships, different ways that we would approach purpose and joy and meaning. It's all different because Jesus did things so different. And following him can look different than we think. Sometimes I think we think following Jesus is like what it was like when we played those games when we were elementary students, you know? Like when you played uh, Simon Says, you know? It's like Simon Says, Stand Says, whatever. It's like we're like, Jesus says, stand up. Stand up. Jesus says, raise your hands. You're like, raise your hand. Jesus says, jump them down. Jump them down. Feed the hungry. Oh, didn't say Jesus says. It doesn't count, you know? It's like, oh, you're out. Too bad. Or, or did you ever play Red Rover? You know where everybody's like standing in the, on the other side and they're like, Red Rover, Red Rover, send Jen right over. And you're like looking at the other people and you're like, do I even want to be on that team? Like, I, I, don't, I don't know. If I run over there, am I going to break through? Okay, are they going to even let me in? I don't know, you know? Or did you ever play like red light, green light where the kid's up front, you know, and it's like when their back is to you, that's the green light and they turn around and it's the red light. Sometimes I feel like following Jesus feels like that. Like, okay, I'm, I'm going out. No, I'm stopping, going, stopping, no. And then the thing is, like, if I get it wrong, am I out? Is that how it works following Jesus? I don't think so. The good news is following him, he doesn't play games with us. It's not, it's not easy, but it's not complicated. 
He actually sets it up for us so that we can follow him with our lives and do something a little bit different. It's a pretty amazing upside down kingdom of God that we're invited into. God isn't playing games. He doesn't make it hard for us to follow. For those of you who are in a 12-step program, you kind of know what it is like to like follow something, right? And I think our, the way that we uh, follow Jesus is very similar to that process. It's like, okay, we surrender to a higher power, something much greater than we are. We have people who surround us that have gone before us and have a little more experience, people behind us who need a little hand up, help out. We follow a big book, follow what it says. Our big book is living and active and it actually intersects with our life and changes who we are. It's pretty powerful. We go to meetings this morning. It's the same kind of thing. When we're invited in to follow Jesus, it's this process of being invited in to walking alongside of him. I love the way that Jesus describes it. He always uses imagery to help people like me understand what he's talking about. And he, he talks about what, it, what it's like to be the, the vine and the branch, that he's the vine and we're just branches. The whole goal is to stay connected to him, to figure out ways in our life to get our, our dependence completely from him. He uses the picture of a shepherd to a sheep, and I love that one because sheep are dumb, <laughs> or at least people think they're dumb, and, you know, maybe we are too, <laughs> and we go back to those places we shouldn't. Uh, the truth is about sheep is they're actually not that dumb. They're just nearsighted, so they can only see, like, what's right in front of their face. So, you know, maybe we can relate to that. But we have a God that sees past, present, future. He knows your story. He knows your purpose. He knows the meaning that he has for your life. And he is our shepherd. And he says to us as his little sheep, listen to my voice. This is the way. Walk in it. He uses the imagery of a father and a child. This picture that no matter what we do, his love for us is unconditional. A good father to a child. He says, it doesn't matter what you do wrong. I'm not going to love you any less. It doesn't matter what you do right, I'm not going to love you more. I just love you because you're mine. And that's unconditional. And it's out of this knowledge, out of this experience that we recognize this is what following Jesus is. It's being known, seen, loved, called to something bigger than ourselves, building our house on a rock that the foundation will not rust or destroy. It's putting our lives into something that matters. It's getting to watch miracles. It's getting to watch him raise people from the dead. It's getting to watch him bring something in me that is dead back to life. This is what it is to follow Jesus? Well, this is really different. It's different than I thought. I thought it was just a bunch of rules. But what it is, it's actually a relationship. It's a connection to a God, to a Father who loves us. I love the way Dallas Willard describes following Jesus. He says, you don't start with the rules. You don't start with the commandments. You start with love. And then the commandments come out the other end of the pipe. This idea that when we we love him, we know what, what we have received. It automatically leads us to repentance, leads us to following, leads us to doing things Jesus' way. Following Jesus isn't always easy, but it's never complicated. He uh, gave a sermon um, that's been called the greatest sermon ever written. It was the Sermon on the Mount. Um, Maybe you've heard of it before. But he talks about all these cool things that it looks like when we follow what it actually looks like to be known and to to follow Jesus. And uh, a guy named Matthew uh, wrote it down which is pretty cool. And I love the way Chosen even sort of plays around with the idea that Matthew was writing it and they kind of make it so Jesus is like running it by Matthew before he starts. And Matthew's kind of a literal guy. So he's like, I don't understand like salt in the earth. Like, what are you talking about, Jesus? Like, maybe go back to the drawing board a little bit. And I'm not sure if that's actually how it went down. But I love this picture um, that, that Matthew basically tells Jesus, go write a better intro. And Jesus decides to to write a map, so check this out in The Chosen. Matthew. Matthew. Bye-bye. I've got it. The opening? Yes. What is it? A map. 
Wait, what? Directions where people should look to find me. Okay, give me a moment. <clears throat> Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful. For they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward will be great in heaven. Yes, but how is it the map? If someone wants to find me, those are the groups they should look for. And then? You are the salt of the earth. <laughs> this is the map. Jesus says, follow me, and it includes you, and it includes me. He said, if you need direction, follow me. Looking for purpose, follow me. Stuck in your addiction, follow me. Confused about your identity, follow me. Judgmental of other people, follow me. Hurting, broken, lost, directionless, follow me. When we want to know if there's more to this life, Jesus says, follow me. And when we are following him, we look like love. And then people, those people, have a new way to follow him too. And that's what we get to do together. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much that you let somebody like me in and that you let people that I would never even imagine that you would let in, you let in. God, there's people in this room that need to hear that today, that regardless of what they've done, how far they've run, Wherever they are, how many people have rejected them that you do not. And so I pray, God, that you just speak to them today and that they would hear your words, follow me, come on, come on, right this way. And that they would hear you and that they would do it, have courage to do it. Thank you for the way that you are working and the way that you love us. In Jesus' name.